Player Profile Series from Australian Football Video. Your football heroes as you've never seen them before. Lockett, Hawkins, Danaher, Dacos, Shaw. Playing legends in our greatest game. Relive their career highlights. Hear them speak out in exclusive interviews. And follow the paths that led them to football glory. Plugger, The Hawk, Terry Danaher, Dacos Magic, Captain Courageous. Every football fan should see these classic titles from the Player Profile Series. Start collecting the Player Profile Series from Australian Football Video now. Australian Football Video proudly presents Vintage Football from the Seven Sport Classics Collection. Seven's magic moments and the sensational 70s. Football action to get your blood boiling. In Seven's magic moments, thrill to 30 minutes of unrivaled football history. From the brilliance of Baldock to the antics of Jacko. The unforgettable marks, the freakish goals and the characters that make this our greatest game. They all get a Guernsey in this marvellous tape. And the sensational 70s. 105 minutes of highlights from one of Aussie Rule's finest decades. A decade that opened and closed with mighty grand final clashes between two giants, Carlton and Collingwood. Saw back-to-back -back flags for Richmond in 73 and 74. The drawn 77 grand final and the emotion-charged replay. And the emergence of the ruse as a VFL power. Don't miss Seven's magic moments and the sensational 70s. Two more magnificent collector's items from the Australian football video range. Add them to your video collection now. Good evening from the Southern Cross Hotel in Melbourne, the Bull Room here. The counting of votes, the 1991 Brownlow Medal. We welcome you through Seven Sport and also the announcement of the AFL All-Australian Team 1991 by CUB. Well, footy's a team game. The ultimate prize, the ultimate glory is a premiership, but the highest individual honour is and will always be the Brownlow Medal. Ironically, in 1991, the year the AFL boasts a legitimate national competition, one man has dominated Brownlow Middle discussion. He's an Irishman. And today I've spent some time thinking about Jim Steins, wondering how he's coping with the pressure and the attention that goes with being the hottest favourite in Brownlow Medal history. Not every favourite wins a big event. The Melbourne Cup is testimony to that. And on Brownlow Medal night, favourites often get knocked over. So I wonder what's in store for us tonight. Will the book run true to form? Will Steins be a runaway winner? Or will there be an upset? Will one of the other champions, Lockett, Mainwaring, Francis, Bairstow or Hocking, upset the man who they say can't be beaten this evening? The hardest part of telling this story is convincing people that it's true. An Irish schoolboy recruited on a mission funded by Rupert Murdoch becomes the champion of a game on the other side of the world. A bizarre plot? Well, it's the story of Jimmy Steins. I come from a family of eight, six kids, and uh, I was brought up in Dublin, on the south side. And I've, my, both my parents, my father and mother, were very involved in sport. Um, Mum more in athletics and camogie, which is the hurling, could have been the hurling, and then dad with Gaelic football. And we used to go and watch dad playing. Keep your eye on the ball. Pull it down into your chest. Because now I can punch it out of your hands. 
you know, he used to coach us. Uh, he was a coach of the, the local club team, and he made sure that you know that we were playing as much football as we could, Gaelic football. And he was doing it because he hoped one day we would play for Dublin. Jimmy was born to play the Irish game. He was swift and agile, and he could run forever. In school cross countries, his stamina astounded his friends and teachers. But Gaelic football was the family passion, and Brian Steins took his older son to Croke Park. I weaned him in Croke Park, and the uh, same with his brother Brian and Dave, the whole lot of them. But um, <coughs> I'll always remember him in particular. Uh, he had no choice at all because he was the oldest fella and he, uh, he ha naturally had to go with his dad. And he'd always grab his, he had a box, and he'd grab the box and say, OK, Dad, are you ready? We're off to Crow Park. Bec and uh, the box was to help him to see. It was a remarkable chain of events in 1984 when Jim was 18 that was to change his life and his family's forever. On the other side of the world, coaches and officials of the Melbourne Football Club had hatched a radical scheme to recruit Irish lads for a game not unlike Gaelic football. They'd already recruited two players from Ireland two years earlier, and they proposed a clinic in Dublin in 1984. Jim might never have gone to that clinic, except he was chosen after he filled in for an injured teammate during a Dublin Miners game. The Melbourne Football Club then came over, Barry Richardson, Ron Barassi and Dick Seddon, and they held a clinic in Dublin and 20 of us were invited along and five of us happened to be from Dublin. So I got a, couple, I got a day off college to go along and, and uh, Dad said, you know, go and enjoy it, but whatever you do, make sure you don't get picked because we've spent the whole summer trying to get you into college and we finally got you in, so don't go and blow it now. So I said, yeah, no worries, Dad, I'll go along. I might get a free jumper out of it or a free footy or something like this. And Ron Barassi believed that there were players out there in the world that could be converted to Australian football. Rupert Murdoch was the man who funded those early uh, trips and expenses because Melbourne didn't have any spare cash to, to throw out a new idea of this dimension. Uh, and I'm led to believe that it was done by Rupert's News Limited because it, it had a sort of, a, it was entrepreneurial, it was international, which of course News Limited are, and uh, it just appealed to them. Along I went and, uh, you know, they showed us, the Brassy started off with a chat about football and none of us could understand what he was talking about. He was trying to tell us the scientific way of kicking a ball or something and it just went straight over all our heads. And then we went out and he said, they just gave us a footy each and said, start kicking it, do something, whatever you want. So we're trying to kick it and bounce it and all this. And we we're watching some of the guys who'd been to Australia and they'd seen it. And we're watching them and you know you'd bounce it and they'd come up and hit you in the guts or hit you in the knee or hit you between the legs or whatever. But never seemed to come back to your hands. And I spoke to them about the Australian game and I've learned since that they all they just couldn't understand what I was talking about. <laughs> Which I think is rather funny because I, I you know, I put a lot of time and effort into <laughs> this presentation of, of a few of the skills that needed to be learnt and how it was a different ball and all that sort of thing. So 1984 was when I actually first spied this uh gangly looking, um, looks a bit like a young foal in those days. And if you've seen an Irish suntan, skinny white legs out of white shorts was not a pretty sight. On the Sunday they, uh, they asked me if I'd like to come out. And uh, I just said, oh, look, I have no idea. I don't know, I said, look, I'll have to ask mum and dad. And said, so, so I rang dad up and dad said, oh, he said, what do you want? He says, don't tell me. I said, yeah, dad. I said, yeah, I got picked, he said. Oh, Lord, he says, what are we going to do now? <laughs> and he sort of said, well, you're not going to take it, are you? I says, well, look, that I don't know. We'll have to have a chat. So we spent the night. I had a week to make, it, make up my mind. So I had a chat, and uh, I had a girlfriend at the time, and that was pretty tough as well. So uh, we made a decision, and everyone said I'd be crazy if I didn't go. And um, in the end, Dad thought, yeah, it'd probably be the best thing for you. Go and give it a go. Go for two years, see how it goes. They call them the Goliaths. And most footy fans thought they were just a touch crazy when they took off for Melbourne's Eston Airport back in 1968 for a tour of Ireland. The matches in Ireland were a great success. The Australians, led by Ron Barassi, took them on at their own round ball game. The Aussies had toured Ireland as far back as the 60s when Ron Barassi led this mob called the Galahs. Ironically, their opponents included Jimmy's dad, Brian. 
But come 1984, when Jim and another Irish lad, James Fahey, arrived in Melbourne, the local scribes thought them a novelty. Uh, so with the photographer, I proceeded down to the MCG and um, uh, caught a glimpse of this wiry, sinewy uh, stick figure and another fellow, uh, James Fay, a rather dumpy, portly lad who was with Jim at the time. Um, just progressed from there, basically. Uh, first glimpses weren't sort of uh, impressive. I thought, well, this is football's answer to Laurel and Hardy. I mean, if you can remember back to those times, we... Melbourne people were the joke of the AFL. Fancy going to Ireland, you know, and trying to get a football. Why can't you get them in your own backyard? I was uh, very sceptical of the whole idea, actually. Um, I first started playing with Sean White, who was one of the, the pioneers of the whole thing, I suppose, the Irish experiment, and I really didn't believe uh, in the whole idea at all. Slog was the culture the under-19s and uh, the reserves. And I think it was early in, in ja January we met up with, with Ray and uh, Slug Jordan and he, uh, when we had a first training session, which was then February, you know, which was, I'll never forget, it was 42 degrees. And uh, he wouldn't let us have a drink. I wouldn't let us take our tops off. And, you know, I just couldn't believe the heat. You know, and I just had to have a drink. And, you know, we didn't know anything about building up fluids and all that sort of stuff. And it was a nightmare. You know, it wasn't a very hard session, but it was hard enough for us. And uh, I, that's when I first time I realised how tough Australian rules was. He kept calling, uh, uh, get, get the ball up straight, a ref, you know, and the umpire said, listen, I'm not the ref, I'm the umpire. And he kept calling the boundary umpire the ball boy. Hey, get it up, I ball boy, you know, <laughs> and all those type of funny little things. What they do in the Gaelic football, as you probably know, they mark the ball and they're allowed to turn around and the guy can only put their arms out and not tackle them, so therefore they've only got to brush past an arm and push it aside and play on. Well, he's taken this mark in the goal square and then he can turn around and play on because the fellas grabbed him, dropped him the ball, so we lost a, a certain early goal from the first mark he's taken in the game. So I said, get him off the ground, you know. So I got him off the ground. I said, what are you doing, you know? I probably swore at him, but I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, uh, well, right, uh, right old Slocky said, I wouldn't do it again. Well, you know, ten minutes later he's back on, does the same thing. So we just had a rule in. I said, every time you do something like that, that's very basic and wrong, I'm going to drag you off the ground. You know, he'd take me off the ground if I made mistakes. And, and uh, if, to me, I just never thought he was giving me a chance, but he was just telling me, you know, that this game's not easy and you've got to work hard, and you've got to learn by your mistakes. And I did, you know. If I was doing something wrong, there was no way I was going to do it again because I didn't want to be sitting on the bench. Though he was runner-up in Melbourne's under-19s best and fairest in 1985, the club dispatched him to VFA side Paran and told him to work on his strength and skills. The only reason he wouldn't have gone home is because I think that he, he believes in himself and he's a winner. It's all due, I guess, to, to his perseverance and really he's got a, an unshakable faith in his own ability, which um, guys uh, lesser um, faith in themselves, I suppose, might have chucked it in many years ago. No footballer to come through AFL football has had more weaknesses than Jim Steins, but he's rectified most of them. Unmarked is White. Melbourne's fourth goal since half-time. Grinder a chance. Kicks in towards Sean White. Members side, White, good strong mark. White, so while Sean White, who'd been recruited two years earlier, established himself with Melbourne and proved the Irish experiment could succeed, Jimmy Steins was facing the first of many hurdles. That's when I said, that's when I really made it in my mind, I'm staying here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do out of Pran which was great because I enjoyed it. I was enjoying my football. We were winning because at Melbourne, the seniors were losing and training was really hard and the atmosphere wasn't good at all. So I went down there, had a great time, played well and still trained at Melbourne once a week on the Tuesdays, the hard session. And then came back the next year and you know, they invited me, you know, I was back for pre-season. And... Oh, he had a long way to go. He just had a long way to go. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't a natural at that stage. I mean, Stephen O'Dwyer was in front of him and playing football in front. But uh, Jimmy, I would say, is irrepressible and uh, got a lot of confidence in his own ability. And I think that's the thing that really started to shine through, even at that stage when he wasn't getting a game. I think probably the thing that 
I think it's been a great help to, to Jimmy was uh, Don Scott, I think, having Don around. I think this year probably Jimmy and uh, being an Irishman at times, you know, they tend to know everything about Australian football. And uh, I think this year he probably listened more to other people around as well as, as I said before, making those sacrifices and working very, very hard. But listen more became, I thought, more team orientated and, and certainly did all the team things and helped the team out. And that in turn uh, certainly helped Jimmy Steins. Wilson with class gets past Bradley. His kick then is ineffective. It comes to Batterston. Out wide to Bailey, he's well tackled. Ball comes clear to Steins. Steins shoots for goal and puts it through. Well, what a good goal by Jim Steins. Love it. Off to Hughes. Hughes kick to the wing. Steins. Good mark by the big fellow. The battle here puts Graham Melbourne up towards the half forward. And what a mark taken by Steins. It just looks so simple. 1987 was to be a memorable year for Steins and for Melbourne. First in only Jim's third game, the Knight Premiership. All night, full marks to Essendon also, great performance. Let's go down the ground to Peter G. Yes, and that's Robbie Flower. But down there to Peter G. There's so much noise. Amazing there. scenes down here with Robbie Flower showered in champagne. Rod Grinter. One of the best players for the Demons is with us. Yes, John right, Norby. you must have dreamt about it. Well, since you got in the grand final, yeah. and here it is. Well, I knew we were going to win it because we had a lot of young blokes in. That was just an enormous um, feeling, especially well, you know, at the end when we presented the cup and we lifted Robbie Flair and John Norby up on our shoulders. And the celebration, that, because it was the first time Melbourne had won anything in something like 23 years. Then Melbourne began a fairy tale run to the finals, culminating in one of the most incredible preliminary finals in football history. 67 to 75, eight points the margin. Well, at the moment you'd have to favour Melbourne or Brian Wilson. This is bad news. He's hurt himself badly. Even if they win today, they're going to have some injuries for next week. Wilson, Flower, and if they have to go into against Carlton. Without those two, and what a task. Look at Brian Wilson. He's hurt his shoulder badly, I would say. Eight points of difference. 23 minutes gone. Final corner. White to Langford. Chris Langford. A hurry kick. Newport. Ah, oh, hooked out. Almost a throw. To Kennedy. Kennedy. To Curran. Over the back. Platten. Grabbed by Jimmy Steins. And a long kick. That's the way to play it. Dermot Brereton. Abbott has been a fantastic player in this corner. Over to Langford. Langford, Morris, Spalding. Oh, they're putting in their guts. Morris, over to Paul Deere. Oh, it's Jenky. Jenky, Bakadara. Bakadara's marked. 30 metres from goal, and we must remember Bakadara is one of the best kicks for goal in league football. If he kicks it, if he kicks his goal, they will be two points down. Gary Bakadara, he kicks. Hit the post. Oh, what else are we going to see today, Bob? Well, if ever a side is meant to win a game of football, maybe it's Melbourne as they lead by seven points. Danny Hughes brings the ball back. It's a good long kick. Punch down the ground. Newport takes it. Puts it towards centre wing. Warren Dean gets it, does it. Loses possession. Coming through was Russo. He too loses it. Fine, he's tackled. Which way will it go? Bounces the ball, says the umpire, on centre wing. Approaching the 25-minute mark, Melbourne lead by seven points. Gee, they've had their chances, the Hawks, Bob. They really couldn't get that goal to get within a couple of points, but, boy, it's been a big-hearted effort. There's Jackson. Look at the pace of Jackson. He runs. He sprints. He bounces. This is magnificent football. This will be the winning goal, I think. Yates! Into the open goal goes Graham Yates. He's hooked it. He's missed. Oh, boy, Hawthorne live again. First one side, 
then the other with points on the board from what looked like certain goals. But nonetheless, Hawthorne still need at least two scoring shots. Michael Tuck prepares to bring the ball back into play. Into time on by a nearly 30 seconds. Abbott was up, tapped on again. Yes, is in there. Melbourne tapped the ball out. Russo with a hand pass out wide. It's a free kick off. Melbourne, ball play on by the umpire. How he missed that, I do not know. Punched away. Spalding couldn't take it. Picked up in the centre by Stretch. Stretch forces the ball forward. It's picked up by Warren Dean. He's got a loose man out there in Yates. So too Healy. Healy shepherded by Yates. A good piece of play. And Greg Healy from 50 metres out. Down towards the square. Can it be taken from Melbourne? Yes! Eichold takes the mark. Simon Eichold with the chance of sewing the game up for Melbourne. From behind on replay, Eichold takes the lovely mark. Eichold spent most of the day on the interchange. Has the chance of being the hero. They lead by eight points at the moment. A goal would probably seal the game. 26 and a half minutes have gone. Look at the pressure on young Simon Eichold, the boy from Ormond, 20 years of age. Simon Eichold, oh, it's one point, he's hooked it. Look at the pressure on those players. Well, I think, Bobby, nearly two minutes gone in time on. Can the Hawks come back? A goal and make a goal now to Hawthorne, and this is going to be a sensational finish. I think the time might run out for them, though, as the clock ticks away. Curran, great courage. Off the ground. Here comes Langford. Oh, here's their chance. Green and Platten. Russell Green. He's got it. Morris. Handball. Platten. In he goes. The ball comes loose. Paul Deere. Handball. Goal. Bacanara. And the Hawks are in it. Bacanara's fourth goal. And the margin between the sides. Three points. Only one kick in this game. Whoever gets it out of the centre, what a what piece of football it'll be. 26 and, uh, 27 and a half minutes have gone on replay. Over the top it comes from Paul Deere to Bacchanara, and it's a three-point margin between the sides. The time clock is nearly at the 28-minute mark. There only would be about a minute to go, I would think. The difference, three points in favour of Melbourne. And the Hawks, it would be a sensational victory for them because it showed enormous courage. Oh, smothered away from Swap. Greg Healy, the half forward. Brereton, Campbell gets away. He kicks, he misses. So Hawthorne live again. But from a Melbourne point of view, Pete, it's at the right end of the ground. Hawthorne have to come all the way down the ground. 26, 28 and a half minutes have gone. Alan James has a close look at the situation. The long kick taken by Swell plays on. Langford comes out with the ball. Drives it down. Buccanoa trip. Buccanoa's free kick. Siren sounds. There's when the, the final goal. siren sounded, Hawthorne's Gary Buccanoa needed a goal to steal the game from Melbourne. And as you can just see, the player sprinting across his mark is Jimmy Steins. The resultant 15-metre penalty gave Bacchanara an almost certain goal. If he kicks this goal, Hawthorne are in the grand final. The umpires haven't heard it yet, I don't think. If he kicks this goal, Hawthorne are in the 1987 grand final. If he misses, Melbourne are in. There's the kick. It's a goal. It's a goal. Hawthorne have won with a kick after the siren. What a performance. A magnificent performance this by Hawthorne. Poor old Melbourne. You've got to, the hearts go out for the Melbourne Football Club. Stephen Stretch can't believe it. But there's the character. That was a courageous win that by Hawthorne. They were down and out, Bob. Uh, look at the expression on the fans. That look at Earl Spalding. Melbourne players absolutely demoralised. Hawthorne, understandably, well, they're over the moon. A magnificent fight back. But you must feel for those Melbourne players. They were absolutely superb in defeat. Well, I can understand how they must feel. Inexperienced in many cases. But, well, Hawthorne's comeback, absolutely magnificent. They've earned the right 
to, to meet Carlton next week. A fairy tale end comes to an end as Melbourne beaten, certainly beaten, but not disgraced. Melbourne, in many respects, deserves to be there next week. They can hold their head high. They were great in defeat. John Northey, superb as, as a coach of Melbourne. But what a magnificent fight back, Pete. Well, it was a fantastic effort by both sides. What a pressure kick. Ah, oh, I'll never forget that. As long as I've been covering football, Gary Bacanari proved himself a true champion. He kicked five goals. He had to kick that. But I think, I really believe that 15-metre penalty made all the difference to that kick. Oh. I doubt whether he would have kicked it from where he was, Bob. No doubt about that. And that just shows you that, you know, a little bit of undisciplined uh, play can cost you. But let's not worry about that. Let's thank and congratulate every player that was out there. ground. That man there carried a wrist injury, Dippy and a minute ago, stayed on the ground. Well, you know, as I came in off the ground, I was pretty disappointed. I had my head down. I just couldn't look at anyone. The directors are all there and just inside the rooms. And, Photographers were everywhere, and I just, I just couldn't look at the way, and I couldn't face anyone with coach. And, and I sort of briefly looked up and saw John on the far side, and he was going for it. You know, he, he was really disappointed, and uh, he just, yeah, all I can remember is him saying, "Just don't do that again." And uh, you know, at the time, you know, he could have said anything, and you know, I would have accepted it. You know, <laughs> you know he could have said, "You never play for Melbourne again," and I would have said, "Fair enough." No, I was so disappointed. And, uh, you know, we, we sat down and everyone just had their heads. I didn't even look around. I just had my head in my hands and I just couldn't look at anyone. It was, uh, you know, it would have been like that for 10 minutes, easy, 20 minutes. I called him probably all the silly bastards under the sun. Um, would have been ready to pull limb from limb at that stage, you know, I mean, it was a very tense time at that stage, uh, the game going either way and, and uh, our first opportunity to play in a grand final, you know, was, was just so disappointing and frustrating that we couldn't do anything about it. However, having thought about it, after and uh, the event is always very heated at that stage, you know, and, and our mind just goes ways perhaps that it shouldn't. But looking back over it, I mean, uh, had Simon I shall kick the goal that Simon should have kicked, had Rodney Grinton not given away that free kick, uh, had from Langford's kick straight down the centre of the ground, had we had players in the correct position behind the packs would have stopped that ball, uh, the game was over. You know, it, that's why I said it, it would be terrible if it happened at the end of your career because you go out on a sound note. Whereas I knew that, okay, this has got to be the start. I've got to build on this and I've got to, you know, make up for it. I'd say it's it's impossible to make up for something like that. But I had to say, well, look, I'll repay something back to the club for what I'd done. And uh, you know, uh, I was determined to do what I had to do and try my backside off just to get back in there and, and do the best I could for the team. And, so I worked really hard, and, and as it turned out, we made a grand final the next year. Bounds yet again. Back in round seven, Melbourne defeated Hawthorne by 21 points. In round 17, Hawthorne defeated Melbourne by 69 points. Jimmy Steins recruited from Ireland. Remarkable story. And Viney went down in short order. The ball's out of bounds. McGuinness goes down. Steins and McGuinness now. Nothing subtle there. And the umpire's gone across. He's yes, awarding a free kick to Steins. An experience from McGinnis. They don't mind crossing lines, Hawthorne. To centre half forward, Steins a good mark. In 1988, Melbourne made the grand final, but was soundly beaten by a record margin again by Hawthorne. At this time every year, there's O'Dwyer, Steve O'Dwyer, who was suspended early in the week, commiserating with Jim Steins, but much was made of that suspension again and what we saw today it would have stood for naught even though he was fourth in melbourne's best and fairest in 1988 and third in 1990 the hardships still outnumbered the triumphs however in 87 and 90 jim briefly returned to the gaelic game for test series in australia and ireland scores were close midway through the second quarter and even a behind would have helped but hang on mill a poster means play on in this game we'll see if brunsey can find the opening if you're Irish, the name Jack O'Shea has a ring to it, and it was great to have Jim Steins back. 
and over to Jimmy McCartan, who'd just come on, gave the visitors the break they wanted in the third quarter. A slight hiccup, though, when one of the Grimley twins was sent to the sin bin. But they could still afford enough for three on the mark as Gavin Brown led a late fight back. But Kevin O'Brien sealed it for Ireland with a minute to go, giving David Parkinson ammunition for the second test in Canberra. But even in 1991, the year that Jimmy Steins came to dominate Australian football, his career seemed set for oblivion after the first game. During that week, I was called into the match committee, into the room, and they said that, that uh, they wanted to know why I wasn't playing well. And I looked up on the board where they had the team, and I wasn't in it. So I wasn't going to be playing in the second game. And I got the fright of my life. I couldn't believe it. From the one game, you know, one bad game I've been playing for so many years, and, and being vice captain and all these things, you think, oh, this can't be happening to me. And it was. And they wanted to know, and I basically I said, look, just give me a chance in the rock, just let me play on the ball. I don't mind swapping, just give me, you know, give me ten minutes a quarter, give me anything, just let me, you know, from the forward pocket. And uh, after 20 minutes, when I walked out, they decided yeah, they'd give me a go. Fitzroy versus Melbourne. Melbourne, T. Viney, one vote. Melbourne, G. Lovett, two votes. Melbourne, J. Steins, three votes. When the votes were being Brisbane counted for the best North and fairest Melbourne. player in the Australian North Football Melbourne. League, Jim Steins was the hottest favourite ever for the Brownlow Melbourne. medal. 1991 had been an exceptional year. He'd won all the media awards, his club's best and fairest award, even the Players Association trophy. seen a guy travel around with a suitcase and all that was in it was uh, one pair of jocks for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> as the games rolled by in 91, the football world was astounded by his stamina, just as those teachers were in Ireland a decade ago. He was everywhere, the inspiration for Greg Champion to perform this song. Sign said nine dollars fifty to get into the ground, but we didn't have no money, so we walked the whole ground around. We kind of see the demons play, we've been waiting for this day. And inside the ground, we could hear the sound, we could hear the spectators say, They said, Stein, Stein. Everywhere Steins Blocking up the scenery Breaking my mind He's here, he's over there Look out for Jimmy Steins And the sign said you got to have a member's medallion To get inside But we conned the gatekeeper Got through the gate Cause we come to see Jimmy Steins as we hasten to our seats, we can hear the crowd going wild. Because someone had taken a big, big mark, and that someone was Jimmy Stein. And the crowd roared, Steins, Steins, everywhere Steins. Blocking up the scenery, breaking my mind. He's here, he's over there, look out for Jimmy Steins. Sign said, stay off the ground until the second siren sounds. But we did what all good footy fans do. We ignored it and ran on the ground. We had to get to our hero. We had to pat him on the back. We had to touch him one more time, cause there's only one Jimmy Steins. And the crowd roared, Steins, Steins. Everywhere Steins, blocking up the scenery, breaking my mind. He's here, he's over there, look out for Jimmy Steins. Jim's athleticism and his Irish irreverence had captured the hearts of Melbourne, and when it came to choosing a partner for the Brownlow medal count, well... 
How's this for a dramatic bid from television star Elle McFeast on ABC's Live and Sweaty? And I thought this week we'd take a look at the man behind the myth on the AFL field. Yes, I'm talking about Brownlow medal favourite Melbourne Ruckman and homesick Irishman all rolled up into the one very, very tall package, Mr Jim Steins. Jim, who are you taking to the Brownlow? This stage, I don't know yet. Have, have you got a date? <laughs> Um, I'm sure I'll, I'll find one by that time. Do you think? I'll try anyway. And what what um, qualities does she need to have? Oh, well, at this stage I'll uh, really... Well, does, she, does she need to be blonde? Has to be blonde, yeah. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> you ever wanted to do anything else other than play football? Um, uh, I suppose a couple of things, but um, as well as playing football. Yeah. Like what? Um, not playing the piano now. But oh, I think we'd yeah. be really good together. <laughs> With you? Yeah. What did you wear? Yeah. What, uh, I don't know, some sort of... Smoky bar. Yeah? Sort of, you in a tux and me in a gown. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> another bright, another chill, another... Too bad. Are you Not taking me to the Bramlow now? Never. <laughs> Besides Elle's overture, Big Jim had won himself many more admirers. At the Celtic Club, they're all hoping for a Steins win, even former AFL Tribunal Chairman Jack Gaffney. I think Jimmy uh, typifies all that's good in Australian rules football, and it is the greatest game in the world, despite what people say. But there is no bigger Steins fan than Mary Fink. Steins' is number two mother. Not only is the family car a moving billboard for Steins, inside the signs are there already for an Irish win. Young James could win anything. Young James will win tonight. Young James has been on a winning streak since about May. But what if he does lose? He's not going to lose, is he? I mean, I've got the shamrocks in my hair, haven't I? But there was really only one partner Jim could take to the Brownlow medal, his father who'd arrived from Adelaide, Dublin to share yes, the special three, night of his three, life. So we declare Jim Steins from the Melbourne Football Club the winner of the 1991 Brownlow medal. And uh, Jim would like to come to the uh, presentation area. Jim with his father Brian has made the long trip from Ireland to be with his son tonight. And it is a very emotional scene here. As you'd expect, David Cloak who came home with such a rush. John Northey, the coach. And boy, can the Irish celebrate. And they'll be doing that in Melbourne and right around Australia tonight. So, Jim, if you'd like to come up and uh, join us here for the official presentation. He's everyone's favourite, both for the Brownlow medal and as a good all-round guy. Jim, congratulations from everyone. We might invite Jim's father, Brian, also to the stage, 
who's uh, come out from Ireland. And uh, Jim, your mum Tess is at the Menzies at the Rialto right now. Come in, Brian. Jim's dad, Brian. And um, Jim, I know you've shared this moment uh, with Dad already. Why don't you share it with Mum, uh, Tess, who's at the Menzies at the Rialto, and we'll be making her way very shortly. You can say something to her now. Speak English, Jim. Jim. Give us a tattoo. Tattoo go home, Jim. Jim. It's are absolutely you? fantastic. How You're a great old. Yeah. Jim. Yeah, I'm delighted hear. with you. I can't listen to you. I'll only start crying if you start talking. <laughs> Maybe we should start talking Gaelic and we'll get away with it. Yes, yes. <laughs> Tess, one of the yes. proudest moments of your life? Absolutely. Uh, I just can't believe it yet. You well, know. a lot of um, us can't believe it either. Yeah. I, I was so apprehensive there when they were doing the voting. And um, I suppose I, I, you kind of think, well, can he, can he be caught? And you're listening to the other votes from Hocking and from Turley. And uh, <laughs> then when I realised that, that Jim couldn't be caught, well, um, it was that, I really can't describe what I feel. All I can, all I can say is, uh, I was holding onto this green bag. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but I think this has brought me a lot of luck tonight. <laughs> Ryan, let me, know, let me know this. I mean, seven years ago, I said earlier, Jim hadn't seen a game of Australian football. Were you and Tess in favour of, of letting your young son come all the way down under? Well, the mother was, but... Um... <laughs> I'm a bit of a pessimist, and uh, I like to watch them play. And I, I was against it because I couldn't watch them play over in Australia. To me, it was another world. But you get the telly there now, don't you? I mean, you see yes. the matches in Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> Had to get a plug in for Channel Seven, Jim. But by the way, Jim, we'll get we'll get back to you in a moment as well. It, oh. I nice. believe that um, it took a long time before they showed him over in Ireland. Well, it's a long time before he became a superstar, but he certainly is now. Is it true, Jim, that when Barry Richardson came in 1984 that there was yourself and another young fellow called Niall Quinn, who you looked at? Niall Quinn's gone on to be a striker at uh, Manchester City and uh, Arsenal, I think. Yeah, yeah Niall no, no, was the year before I came out, and um, he, he's gone on to be uh, you know, a fantastic soccer player, and he's uh, helped Ireland get through to the quarterfinals in Italy last year, so he's uh, been fantastic. Jim, I just said at the start of the programme, I thought about you today. What were you thinking about today? Um, no, I just tried not to think about it. It's just, uh, it's very hard. You know, we went out and played golf this morning just to get away from it, but uh, it's just fantastic. I just can't believe I'm up here. I just, <laughs> well, it's amazing. you can have an Irish celebration tonight. Brian, Jim, Tess, the Steins family, yeah, they'll, be, uh, they'll be celebrating right around the world. We'll take a break. Hey, hang on, I've got to take a few people. Hang on. Okay, go. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? It's live. Um, I'd just like to, um, there's a few people that mean a whole lot to me, and, um, especially down at the club and of course my father has been the catalyst in bringing me to where I am. He's always there as a, as, as a coach all the way through and also um, when I got out here he was really tough and also uh, John Norty. I think this year he gave me a lot of faith to play in the rock and you know it could have been a different position but he put faith in me and let me go and I really appreciate both my dad and, and John. They've been fantastic. Also the rest of the players it's uh, it's hard coming out to a, to a club and coming out to Australia, but the guys at Melbourne have been fantastic, and Gary Lyons has been a, an amazing captain. You know, I'd, I'd hate to be in your position, but you've done a great job this year. And uh, the rest of the guys, it's just fantastic. The guys that are not here, get your ass in here quick, excuse me. <laughs> but um, also, I'd like to thank um, a couple of people. I have to thank the club for giving me the opportunity to come out, come out here. They put a lot of faith, and Ron Barassi was, uh, you know, he took a lot of stick about it. And, um, I'd just like to thank him. He's here somewhere. I'll get a chance later for bringing me out here. It's, it's fantastic. Um, uh, also, I'd like to say thanks to Don Scott, who really got a lot out of me this year. He, um, he's a rock coach down at the club, and he's been fantastic. And uh, also to Greg Healy, who helped me early in the year when I wasn't playing very well. And we lived together for a few months, and uh, both of us were looking at playing in the reserves, and he really helped me. And uh, Gotta get this out of the way. Um, also, there's a, there's, <coughs> to the guys, a lot of my mates, the Irish lads that I hang around with here, they've been fantastic. And the guys at work and the girls at work. And um, I'd just like to send a special cheerio to uh, two very good friends of mine whose fathers are in hospital. And um, I just hope they come through. So uh, thanks very much. Good on you, Jim.
in Dublin third city, where the girls are so pretty, my purse and my eyes on sweet Molly. The Brownlow celebration was to be the most colourful in history. There wasn't a dry eye or throat in the house. In the days and weeks afterwards, all Melbourne acclaimed Jimmy Steins. He's a wonderful ambassador for his country of birth. And I'd like you to join me. It seems to be the morning of foreign languages. The only little bit of Gaelic I know, and I'm not too sure whether it's the right pronunciation, but it means 100,000 welcomes. And I'd like you to join me in saying Cade Milia Falter to Jim Steins, the 1991 Football Personality of the Year. It's a great day for the Irish. He was on national television. Irishman Jimmy Stein saw an advertisement at a Dublin newspaper looking for Gaelic footballers to try out for Aussie rules. Halfway around the world with the Melbourne Football Club. A crazy Ron Barassi idea. It worked, and last night the proof as the Irishman won Australian rules ultimate individual honour, the Brownlow medal. My studio guest, Jimmy Steins, good evening. How are you, Dan? I'm sorry. And whether they wanted it or not, Jim showered everyone with his goodwill. Jim and uh, Denny, you were the winners. Uh, you did, uh, oh, really? oh, sorry, you did not get the check. Uh, you did, Jim. Can you explain the audience, mate? Yes. Oh, no. well, done. well done, Glenn. Well, Glenn, uh, how did you think it went? You're, uh, you're, uh, you're an experienced... Uh, He's exhausted. Denny, Denny, you're just right in the middle of the camera I'm there. I'm sorry, sorry. absolutely in the middle of it. <laughs> Uh, Jamal had a, a terrific accident with the, with the hay bale. What happened, Jamal? Oh, I went into a... Uh, no! Don't! No! Don't! Jimmy! No! no. 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 for me please take him out will you and it's as, uh, as you can see it's all fun and games here tonight live uh, a time Jennifer of celebration and for some a moment to ponder what impact this jovial Irishman has had on Australia and Australian football and a lot of people ask me who's the best guy you ever coached you know who over the years of Bartlett and uh, going back to Royce Hart in 66 and going all the way through to McCann playing in premierships at North Melbourne when he was 17 and 18, uh, going and coming into Melbourne, who's a you just go for Steins, not because uh, we're doing a show for him today, but because he's done something that no other Australian rules football has ever done. Come into the game after seven years, playing finals in, you know, number one competition, and win a Brownlow. For years it was thought that you had to grow up with this game to be able to play it. But I think that shows that anybody can play it if they really do want to get, if their desire is there and they want, want to do it, you can do it. And I think that is something that, I think that's the most important thing he's brought to the game. I think as the, the evolution of the game, <clears throat> and we sit back in 10 years time in our armchairs and say what has happened during the 90s. I think one thing that will happen during the 90s is that the Ruckman of the 90s will be of a Jim Steins type. So no longer will it be enough for a, a Ruckman to get to the centre bounce, to get a few tap-outs around the game and maybe pick up eight or nine possessions. 
I think that what Jim Steins has brought has been um, enormous endurance and enormous athleticism. The fact that he can pick the ball up at his ankles running at full speed is actually a Gaelic trait. And I believe that what will happen is that players like Stephen Lawrence and to a certain extent young Glenn Jakovic from the West Coast Eagles uh, are the sort of players and the only sorts of players that will be able to counter the likes of the Steins because the, the dinosaur or the slower type ruckman uh, simply won't be able to compete in the endurance stakes. And I think that's what Jim Steins will bring to Australian rules football. He's brought an internationality to the game that we've never seen before, we probably have never accepted before. Uh, his skill level is very, very high. Um, his pace is for the size is tremendous. Um, but he, he added that some excitement to the fact that he wasn't a local-born guy. and he, he came out of something a little bit uh, unusual and uh, something very creative in Australian football. I mean, he's brought an extra bit of fun, I think, uh, a bit of interest. I mean, he's this guy from the other side of the world winning our... our I mean, that's... An, extraordinary feat when you think about it. Uh, I mean, it's, that would be in the Guinness Book of Records. It would be, it should be mentioned the world over as a trivia thing because uh, it would happen so rarely in, in any sport, wouldn't it? I tend to think that Jimmy's a type of bloke that treats his football and life generally with the, the right degree of irreverence. I think uh, it's an amazing story as we all know that a complete foreigner has come in and uh, taken the game by storm. And I just think it's to his credit that he's done that. But from a reporter's point of view, I think he's a knockabout. Uh, if I had to describe him as a player, I'd describe him as a, an Irish ruck rover. But if you had to put a tag on him, I think Irish rover would probably suffice. I suppose the great, one of the other great things for me was it was because I, I suppose I'm so patriotic that I, I was able to do something for Ireland while I was hoping it. I hoped it would do something, you know, the fact that Ireland was getting a bit of a plug and because it's such a great country and, uh, you know, it's a great place and, and uh, you know, I, I don't know what it is, but for people who leave Ireland, they seem to become very, very patriotic and, uh, you know, it, it, it was, a, when I left, I always, it's, I suppose it's something that you think, well, I'll go away and I'll do something and hopefully one day I can come back and say I've achieved something, I've done something. You know, and people can say, yeah, you did it, you know, you, 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 you've done something different. In 1988, Jimmy's younger brother Brian also joined Melbourne and was a member of the Demons' 1991 Reserves Grand Final team. Their dream is to play together in Melbourne's first. Now it's starting to come to the stage where you know, I'm 25 and I'd like to go back and just fulfil that dream of playing with Dublin. Um, but it's getting more difficult all the time. And uh, even though I'd really like to, and you know, although I think the first thing is to play with Brian, play in the senior team together, that uh, play here with Melbourne. And, and once we do that, then it'll be, it'll be great to finish your career playing together with Dublin back home. But, you know, you can't plan that far ahead. And, you know, at this stage, we're just planning. You know, you just look at one, one year at a time and, you know, the next... Because yeah, yeah. with that, like, all the way up through the years, because like, I was that, that much younger than Jimmy, I was five years, it, it was hard sort of, I always aspired to play alongside him. And um, we have played alongside each other in some Gaelic games, because I played senior at home. Before, when he came back, we had a game together and that, and it was just really... I was really good, but then like the real thing was I wanted to play one at a top standard like with him, and um, so like it was sort of the aim was if I could play alongside him anyway, at least if I went home then I'd be happy with getting that. So so that's why like, I'd be very unhappy like, to go home for that. I would love them to play together. Now at some stage I don't mind. I would love them to play for Dublin, but at the same time if I see them together, it yeah. would be even I would be delighted. Even playing play Well, I, the, my, my comment on my leaving after the Brownlow win to Jim was that um, if you want to see me back here again, it'll be when the two of you are out there together. Who's that? Oh, 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 it's the end of it. That was it. The brothers' favourite pastime is watching Gaelic football on video. Yeah, man. We can't do it anymore. We have to kick it in now.
He can kick it in. Put it in his hand and down. But before he does go home, the Irish Rover has one burning desire. He came in 1984 to a country and a game he knew nothing about. But today, his dream is that of every Aussie lad that ever wears a team's jersey. He wants a premiership for Melbourne. I've been playing seven years, five years in the seniors. We've got so close each year, yet we've never reached it. We've been in a grand final, we've been in a primary final, we've been in two semi-finals. We just can't win a premiership. And that's what I want to do. You know, you play t Aussie rules, you play a team sport for to win a, to win what's there and that's to win a premiership a flag it's a team game and you want to take that team accolade that's that's there and everyone plays to win it being a premiership and i'd hate to go back to ireland not winning a premiership his fellow man that's why we love you Dublin Jim true son of Ireland Dublin Jim you've done us proud flying high above the crowd your countrymen from near and far salute you Dublin Jim Dublin Jim you've done Proud, flying high above the crowd, your country. 
countrymen from near and far salute you, Dublin Jim.